creature has an order, a power to restore balance. I believe he is the power. We call him Gojira. The movie opens with some amazing opening credits that really get you psyched for the movie that basically give an overview of the events of 1954, that a mysterious creature appeared in the South Pacific and was taking down American boats and submarines that the United States covered up and created an organization called Monarch to track and deal with the creature, wanting to keep it covered up because the reveal of its existence would be terrifying to the world at large and cause massive amounts of panic. So in order to get rid of the problem quickly and quietly, they decide to cover up trying to kill the creature with atomic testing by luring the creature, who they dub Gojira, based on an ancient South Seas legend, to a group of islands called the Bikini Atoll, where they were already doing some atomic testing, and launch a hydrogen bomb on the thing, attempting to kill the creature. But was it successful? Well, cut ahead a little bit over, under 50 years later to 1999 in the Philippines, and Monarch is still around. Now being seemingly headed, this is kind of left ambiguous, by a scientist named Ishiro Sarazawa and his assistant, Dr. Vivian Graham. Graham and Sarazawa are in the Philippines because of a mine collapse in which a strange, un, un, unknown fossil was discovered that was spilling out radiation all over the joint killing a bunch of miners and giving a whole bunch of other miners radiation sickness, which they don't show in the movie, but they really should have because it's a great scene that's described in the book. But anyway, they go down into the cavern where the fossil is, Sarazawa determining it to be a fossil of a Gojira-like creature, but also discovering two dormant spores inside of the creature's body. Not fossilized like the bones, but rather well-preserved. Seemingly to be parasitic spores, one of them is perfectly dormant, but the other one is gone, having been broken open, revealing that something hatched out of it and escaped the cavern and is now heading towards, what? Japan. In Japan, we're introduced to the Brody family, mainly Joe, Sandra, and Ford. Joe and Sandra working at the uh, local nuclear Janjira power plant as engineers. Joe's tracking some seismic activity leading from the Philippines, which has been covered up as an earthquake and not revealing that a giant monster's in the way. Joe and Sandra go to the power plant to try and figure out what's going on. Sandra going down into the reactor to make sure that all the sensors are working and that nothing's going to crack open and release a whole bunch of radiation. The seismic activity continues, though, and shakes up the foundations of the building. And, of course, big problem causing the reactor to go into meltdown despite them trying to turn it off. Joe goes running down to the reactor to try and get his wife out standing near the door where uh, the reactor connects to the rest of the plant, waiting for his wife to come through. Sandra and her team try and make it, but ultimately don't as the radiation comes careening towards them and Joe being forced to close the doors without his wife. They have a heartfelt goodbye as Sandra comes to the door and takes off her mask, her, sate, her fate being sealed, as well as the doors. The entire plant comes down leaving their son, Ford, who's in a nearby school, seeing the destruction and devastation. We then cut 15 years later to the modern day where Ford is an army EOD technician, meaning explosive ordnance disposal, and he's living with his family in San Francisco, his wife Elle and his son Sam. Ford just got back from several months of active duty over in 
the generic Middle East, uh, and is having some, some intimate time with his wife and promising his son that he's going to be there tomorrow. His son obviously being concerned that his dad's going to up and leave again. Which, guess what, kid, he does as they get a call from the Japan consulate in San Francisco saying that Ford's father, Joe, has been arrested in Japan for attempting to break into the Q-Zone, which is the quarantined area of the uh, Janjira power plant in the surrounding city where the reactor supposedly melted down. Ford goes to Japan, goes to Japan bails his dad out of prison, and his dad has some choice words for his son, attempting to bring him back into trying to discover what exactly happened to, to Sandra back in 1999. Joe thinking that the whole thing wasn't on the level, that there wasn't exa that what exactly caused the meltdown is being covered up, because ultimately he blames himself. He sent his wife down there, he was the engineer of the plant, so he wants to find out what exactly happened. He convinces Ford to go with him back to the Q-Zone because he's been getting some readings that he thinks line up exactly with the readings that happened that day. He thinks that what happened then is going to happen again, so he convinces Ford and they go back into the Q-Zone to go back to their old house to try and get some discs that actually have the information of, of the exact readings of that day so he can prove that they're the same. Joe finds the discs that contain all the proper information on it, but also finds a photo of him, his wife, and his child, which he wasn't able to get access to because of how quickly they were evacuated from the city. He and Ford leave the house, but are drawn to a helicopter which enters the Q-Zone and flies over to where the power plant was, which has now been completely flattened out and replaced with some other sort of facility. But before they can leave, Joe and Ford are taken in by some armored guards, who arrest them and take them to this facility and are interrogating Joe. But before they start interrogating them, Joe notices something strange in the center of the plant. An enormous black object that's beaming orange. Joe says to some dudes who work at the plant that he knows that what they're doing isn't on the level and is being watched by none other than Dr. Sarazawa, who comments that he thought that all the data from that day was lost and that this new information may change how they approach the oncoming events. Noticing that the readings that they're getting off of the object right now are consistent with the readings that Joe Brody got that day, which makes him realize that something's going to happen. And happens something does, as the entire facility is hit with an EMP strike, shutting off all the electricity. Joe Brody saying that it's all building to something big, something major is going to happen, and him also saying that it's going to send them back to the Stone Age. So Sarazawa reacts in kind saying that things have gotten out of hand and that they need to kill it, it being a thing inside of the black object, which we realize to be a cocoon for some kind of creature. They shock the thing with electricity, but it's too late, and a big old monster comes erupting out of the cocoon and destroys the facility, killing a bunch of people and releasing another EMP that lets Joe Brody out, his son out, them both attempting to escape the facility. The Muto goes on a rampage, and in the crossfire of the attack, actually kills Joe Brody, knocking him off of a bridge, including a whole bunch of other Japanese people. Ford watches his father die, and then attempts to escape the monster's wrath as it comes out of its little, its little, like, hole grid thing. The creature then erupts wings and flies away, Ford barely surviving. The next morning, Sarazawa oversees the wreckage of the power plant. We also learn that, jo we also learn that Joe didn't actually die but is just critically injured and Ford and him are about to be taken to a hospital when Sarazawa is approached by some military dudes, American military dudes, who are saying that they're now tracking the creature and that they need him to come with them in order to help track it and deal with the situation before the general public finds out about it. But he doesn't know everything about it himself and wants to know exactly what Joe Brody knew about it, so he takes him and his son with him up in the helicopter. However, during the helicopter ride over to the aircraft carrier where they're going to track the creature, Joe Brody sadly dies, having the parting words to his son to protect his family, whatever it takes. But we're introduced to Admiral Stance, who gives the creature its name, the term MUTO, which is an acronym for Massive Unidentified Terrestrial Organism, and that they can't actually track the creature on radar because of the creature's EMP, so it's a strictly visual pursuit. Meanwhile, Sarazawa gets Ford into a and a bunch of other people into this conference room and, and explain what the hell's going on. Sarazawa gives the backstory of who he and Graham are, working for the organization called Monarch, which was established back in the 50s to, of course, study this giant fucking dinosaur creature that popped up there called Gojira. 
what Sarazawa says, says it later on, people start calling him Godzilla, so for the rest of the review, I will of course call him Godzilla. They explain that Godzilla and the creature that popped up in Janjira today come from a time when the Earth was ten times more radioactive and that they feed on radiation as a food source, the Muto using the radiation of the Janjira power plant to grow into a more, into its adult form, saying that it's going to be seeking more sources of radiation, but that but that they didn't know about the EMP attack, Joe being able to predict it, and Sarazawa wants more information about what exactly he knew about the creature. Ford doesn't know much and just says that his father sent, said something about an animal call, something talking, and also had books on echolocation. Sarazawa hearing this and realizing that the Muto might have been talking to something else and sends Graham to go take another look, them lamenting that if they don't find it soon, something's going to happen. Ford asks, what's going to happen? And Sarazawa just says that nature has a power to restore balance and that Godzilla is that power, implying that if the Muto isn't stopped soon, Big G's going to wake up and take care of business. The Muto heads to Hawaii with a Russian submarine with a Russian submarine $5 foot long in tow, feeding on it, and kills a whole bunch of military personnel on the island who are tracking the submarine. Meanwhile, on the USS Saratoga, Admiral Stance is trying to deal with the situation and trying to figure out what to do about the Muto because there's a whole bunch of people on the island, so no longer it's about keeping secrets and that it's just about safety at this point that they just need to take care of the creature as effectively as possible. However, they also get another blip on the radar. Something is heading towards the island from the sea, and Sarazawa runs up to the flight deck to take a look. Meanwhile, Ford heads to the airport to try and catch a flight back to San Francisco, which is promptly attacked by the male Muto, who knocks out all the lights in Honolulu. The military attempts to take the Muto down, but the EMP attack prevents any air, any air support from attacking the creature. However, from the Pacific, something comes a-coming, and three very iconic spikes are seen erupting out of the water as Sarazawa looks at them with his binoculars and approaches the island. A huge tsunami hits the city as people flee for their lives and head up to the roofs to try and escape the water. With all the lights out, though, they can't exactly tell what erupted out of the water until some military dudes fire some flares up into the sky, which illuminate what exactly came out of the water. And we just see a wall of prehistoric scales. And the terrified reactions of some people. Yup, Godzilla has returned and has come for the Muto. Godzilla heads to the airport, in which we finally see him in all his glory, and, well supposedly has a fight with the Muto. We don't exactly see it. We see it a little bit on a TV screen. But the Muto escapes and Godzilla chases in pursuit. Ford barely surviving the fight and also protecting a young Japanese boy from being killed in the crossfire. The young Japanese boy is reunited with his family and Ford hooks up with some local soldiers who are heading east towards uh, where the creatures are heading. Sarazawa and Graham are trying to catch up on what exactly is going on saying that Godzilla is hunting the Muto and that he'll chase him for as long as he's around. However, what Graham doesn't understand is why exactly the male Muto would call up a predator. Why would he talk to Godzilla? And Sarazawa says he didn't, saying that Godzilla was only listening to a conversation that the Muto was actually having with, gasp, a female Muto, which was in the dormant spore, which had been transported to Nevada after it was discovered in the Philippines. But everybody was convinced that it was completely dormant because, well, it seemed dead. However, thanks to all of the radiation in, Yuc in the Yucca Mountains nuclear containment facility, which is where America dumps all its atomic waste, the creature was able to feed off of that and become a fully formed adult itself to head off to try and meet up with its lover, who, he's only, who she's only been talking to, and destroys the city of Las Vegas. Meanwhile, the military tries to cook, cook up a plan to deal with the monsters, using the fact that they're attracted to radiation as a food source as a plus in order to try and make the battle go their way. They've decided to use a couple of nuclear warheads to attract the monsters to a specific point offshore where they can lead all three where they can lead the Mutos there with the radiation and lead Godzilla there with the Mutos in order to blow them all up in one fell swoop. Sarazawa and Graham mention that this is a dumb idea because they feed on the radiation and that if they blow them up with the bomb, it'll only make them stronger, but everybody says that, oh, the sheer force of the blast will be enough to kill them. But Graham and Sarazawa still think it's a bad idea, but Admiral Stance reminds them that they don't really have any other options. But they're, but they're open to ideas. However, Graham just moves off in a huff, and Sarazawa, 
But Sarazawa just pitched the idea of Godzilla being here to restore balance, that if they just get out of the way and let Godzilla do his thing, he'll take care of the Mutos himself and then return back to the sea. But Admiral Stant says, but he's a big destructive monster too who killed millions of people in Hawaii, so we're not just going to sit by and watch. And that they're going to move ahead with a nuke plan. But Sarazawa tries to appeal to his humanity by showing him that he's dealt with nukes before, by showing him the watch that he was looking at at the beginning of the movie, which we learn was the watch of his father, which he had on him during the dropping of the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. Sarazawa showing that he don't have much love for the nuclear weapons. In the meantime, Ford is on a plane with a bunch of other soldiers, which is redirected from San Francisco to, to California, where a train is being mocked up with a couple of nuclear warheads on it to be moved to the coast, where they're going to lure all the creatures so they can blow them all up. Ford tries to get on this train because his family is in San Francisco, and he wants to do what his dad said, get to them and protect them from all the monster mayhem. He coerces himself to get on the train as the EOD because what their plan is is to retrofit the nukes with an analog device rather than a digital timer that uh, they would use to remote detonate them because the MUTOs are knocking out everything with the MP blasts. So this instead will be a classic kind of clockwork timer that will run entirely on analog and won't require any digital input so that way the MUTOs can't knock it out and fuck around with it which would probably cause an explosion. Ford gets on the train and heads over to San Francisco, but of course, as per usual, things don't go well for our protagonist, as the female Muto attacks the train, attempting to get her hands on the nuke, or her claws rather, on the nuke, destroying the train, getting one of the nukes, killing everybody else on the train except Ford, sending Ford careening into a river, and being the only survivor, with only one nuke left. Also in a rather disgusting shot, showing us that the, fe that the female Muto is already pregnant, Sarazawa is saying that the, Muto, that the Mutos are going to meet up and spawn, which would be a huge problem because, well, if two Mutos are, going to, are enough to cause all this mayhem, imagine how much a whole bunch of them could cause. So obviously things are a little bit bleak. However, they've still got one nuke that they think will be able to attract all of the monsters. So they fly the nuke out to San Francisco, building up to the final confrontation as all three monsters are converging on, are converging on San Francisco Bay. Show up. Godzilla being the first one who pops up by the Golden Gate Bridge while the city is being evacuated, including Ford's son. Godzilla causes a whole bunch of fucking destruction, uh, knocking over a whole bunch of boats and careening through the Golden Gate Bridge as he waits for the Mutos to come so he can, well, kill them. The next to arrive is the male Muto, who attacks the boat that the nuclear uh, weapon is, is on, which is being brought, which has already been armed. The male Muto attacks the boat and brings it into the city, where he meets up with the female and they begin to do happy things. Meanwhile, Godzilla erupts out of the water and begins his fight with the male Muto once again, and tries to kill the two monsters before they mate and spawn. Meanwhile, the military's got a whole new problem on their hands because not only do they have three giant monsters fighting in the middle of a major metropolitan area, now they've got an active nuclear weapon in the middle of said metropolitan area with millions of people caught in the crossfire. Oops. So they need to send in an, another team into the city to deactivate the nuke or get it on a boat and bring it out before it blows up if they can't access the timer before it blows up not only the monsters but the entirety of San Francisco. Ford, being the one who installed the device, is immediately given access to the team, and they are going to be inserted into the city with what's called a halo insertion, with a flight so high up in the, at in the atmosphere that the MUTO's EMP won't be able to interact with it. They drop the soldiers into San Francisco as Godzilla is fighting the, the two MUTO's, and they head towards the female MUTO's nest, where she's already laid her eggs and has already wrapped them around the nuke, feeding off of it. The soldiers get to the nest as Godzilla confronts the female Muto and remove the nuke, but of course the timer has been damaged and they can't access it. So they're going to have to get it to the bay and put it on a boat, having to navigate the field of giant monster battle before they can do that. They move out the nuke, but Four realizes that it's now or never to deal with this whole situation and needs to blow up the nest. So he opens up a gas main, releasing a whole bunch of gasoline into the nest, and then blows it to smithereens, killing all the, ba killing all the baby Mutos which obviously the female does not take well, running from uh, her battle with Godzilla and running over to her now dead babies, Ford trying to get away, but the female sees him, uh, attempts to kill him, but of course Ford is saved by the big G who fucking blows the female Muto away. 
Godzilla's battle with the Mutos continues as Ford tries, as Ford and the other soldiers try and get down to the bay to get the nuke on a boat and send it out. However, Godzilla is distracted by his battle with the male Muto and is unable to deal with the female as she charges towards the bay and kills all damn motherfuckers before they can uh, get the before they can start getting the boat out away from the city. In the meantime, Godzilla kills the male Muto with his tail by slapping it into a building and knocking the building down getting caught in the building coming down on himself, so Godzilla's kind of out of action. Ford and Godzilla have a little moment, and Ford runs down to the bay to try and secure the bomb before the female Muto gets to it and before it explodes. He's able to get the boat moving and heading towards the water. However, with only 10 minutes left, the female has dealt with all the soldiers and is now heading towards Ford, Godzilla obviously being out of action. Ford realizes that his fate is basically sealed, aims his pistol at the 300-foot-tall indestructible monster, and seems like he's about to die, when suddenly help comes from an unexpected place as Godzilla pops up behind the female Muto, grabs that bitch, rips open her mouth, and breathes atomic fury down her mouth, ripping her head off, killing the female, and having both monsters dead. The boat continues to move out, far enough away, Godzilla collapses from being tired, in San Francisco, Ford does the same, but before the bomb is able to go off and kill Ford, a helicopter comes, saves Ford, the bomb goes off, the day is saved, San Francisco is saved, and the world owes it all to Ford and Godzilla. Ford's reunited with his family the next day, as everybody laments the fact that Godzilla seems to be dead, until, of course, he wakes up, rises out of the ashes, Sarazawa and Graham smile, the world cheers at the savior of the King of the Monsters, and Godzilla returns to the sea, nature being at peace. So overall, what do I think of this story? Well, I actually think it's pretty good as a monster story. The first half is fantastic, really building up the situation well, really getting the, the audience invested in the government conspiracy with uh, finding out what exactly happened, and also really getting immersed in this rich world that's filled with backstory. I like that Godzilla's origins are left in the past here, and that we're able to just kind of get wrapped up in the situation now with all this stuff kind of building in the background. It allows for a rich world that's really fun to be in and learn about as we uh, move along the story. The discovery that something weird is going on with the monster is a really, really classic Toho-esque story, and it feels like a classic Toho movie, fitting since this is a modern rebirth of the Godzilla franchise. And the human story is also really, really strong here, with the tragedy of, lose, of Ford and Joe losing Sandra, and the connection of this tragedy in their family to this monster conspiracy. It leads to an emotional but also really fun journey to find out the truth, getting you really wrapped up in the build-up, which is good for a monster story that's really, really slowly paced, which this movie is, at least in the first hour. Uh, it's really slow and takes its time to establish every little faucet of this world and these characters and how they react to certain situations. It's really good in that way. It really fleshes out the whole thing. But as with any good monster movie, and as with any good movie, I should say, the film has a really strong sense of purpose. The purpose is Ford and, Ford and Joe need to fix their relationship as father and son and need to discover what happened to Sandra and what happened to Janjira, so that way they can finally put all these uh, skeletons in the, in the closet to rest and, and move on with their lives. All of this is really, really fantastic and really, really fun, intriguing. It's a perfect monster movie uh, story up until a certain point. The problem with the movie from a human story and also just from a story pacing perspective is that all of the interesting story stuff happens in the first hour. Uh, the story takes its time and fleshes everything out, but the problem is that once it does that, it's all resolved halfway before the movie is over. And also, before Godzilla is even introduced in the story. The problem with all this really good build-up is that it really feels like the movie was kind of wasting its time a little bit, because as good as all that was... We're not even getting to the reason why the movie is here, which is to re reintroduce Godzilla until after all the really interesting story stuff has happened. It's a really bizarre story problem. It just feels like all the interesting stuff is cut off, and that's, there's this really weird lull right when Joe Brody dies, because the movie loses that sense of purpose that he was perpetuating. He was forcing Ford to take a look at the past and go, we need to solve this problem, we need to find out what's going on. That was the whole point of getting to Japan, learning about the conspiracy, going back to Janjira, 
and seeing the Muto waking up. It, it's a really, really good monster movie kind of pacing. And just a good movie pacing. We feel like we're discovering things as we need to discover them. There's a really strong buildup of personal human story to government conspiracy to, oh my god, there's a giant monster. It's a great build. And only seeing snippets of Godzilla in the opening credits and not seeing the male Muto at all in the prologue of the movie meaning everything that happened in 1999, it really lends a lot of credit to that slow build of all the human stuff, okay, now there's a monster, good. But the problem is, again, that it feels a little bit strange because the human story feels complete. The monster is awake, okay, now what? Well, Joe Brody's dead, so that sense of purpose is kind of lost. We feel like the whole movie has now kind of lost what it was getting at. The Muto is now awake. Okay, now what? Now I guess we have to kill it. And again, the issue is that that all of this build-up, as good as it was, is not about Godzilla. We feel like we've, got, we've gotten to a place, and now the movie feels lost trying to give itself a new sense of purpose, because the old one is now gone with Joe Brody being dead. So the new sense of purpose is now, well, okay, uh, Sarazawa is going to introduce Godzilla and say that he's coming to kill the Muto. Okay, well now we're waiting for Godzilla to show up. Alright, Godzilla shows up and fights the Muto off screen. Okay, now what? The movie seems to really lose that build up because it just feels like really strong sense of purpose and then desperately trying to get a grasp on what the rest of the movie is going to be about until we can finally get to the climax. Which is a problem because it lends, it, it, it leads to the first half being the best part of the movie, but the problem is that we're all here for Godzilla and he wasn't even introduced in that half yet. It's a really strange issue and it just leads to a really bizarre sense of pacing. Because again, while the movie is overall really well paced and moving uh, from one good scene to the next, it feels a little bit like um, the first half of the movie knew exactly what it wanted to be and how it wanted to approach the situation. And then once it got to the situation, it was struggling to kind of remold itself into something else, which is a monster fight movie. It's kind of reminiscent of another monster movie that had a similar sense of building up to another, to one monster and then building up to another, which is the original Rodan. There's a lot of strange parallels to Rodan in that way. Um, with really focusing hard on the humans and also building up to one monster first before the idea of Rodan is even introduced, with the Mega Gear, with the Mega Nulas being introduced before Rodan and being the cause of a whole bunch of murders at the beginning of the movie, the ones that perpetuate the mystery of what's going on. Here's why it works in Rodan and doesn't work in Godzilla. In Rodan, that sense of building is completely different than what's happening in Godzilla. Now, the theory sounds the same. We introduce the human story. Okay. Then we introduce the monsters based on the human story. In the case of Rodan, we introduce the Megagiris. Okay. Or Meganulas, rather. Uh, my apologies. And then we introduce the bigger monster. The Meganulas wake up, which then in turn wake up Rodan. Very similar to how the Muto wakes up Godzilla. Here's the difference, though. Once Rodan is introduced into the story, once the story shifts from, all right, we're telling this story about these insect monsters that are killing people in this mine, then to, oh my god, there's a way bigger thing that's eating these things that's going to wake up and kill everybody, Rodan takes center stage. There's a sense of build there. We go from human to small monster to big monster, and we focus on the big monster for the rest of the movie. It's this progressive build that gets us somewhere. In Godzilla, that idea is there, but it's different because we go from the human story to the smaller monster to the big monster, but then the big monster never takes center stage. It continues to be about the smaller monsters, with this big monster kind of being in and out in regards to being focused upon. It feels awkward. And the other thing is that the, the difference between a movie like this and a movie like Rodan is, is that Rodan was the first movie to feature Rodan. When the movie came out, nobody knew what Rodan was. So there's a different st uh, stigma attached to the movie not really being about Rodan for a while until he's finally introduced, and the movie not really being about Godzilla until he's introduced. Because this is a Godzilla movie. Godzilla is uh, way more... Because this is, this is also not like being the first Godzilla movie. Godzilla has had 29 movies before this, so there's a certain expectation of, we're waiting for Godzilla now. And that's different than watching a movie about a monster that you've never heard of, 
And it's just like, we're not waiting for Rodan, we're waiting to see what the movie is getting at. And then once we see Rodan, once we're invested in Rodan, the movie becomes about him. That's not what is happening in Godzilla at all. It's just a very unbalanced movie, which sucks because the first half was really, really balanced. Human story building into the monster story. It was perfect. The other difference between the first half and the second half is that the first half, again, has a very specific purpose and a really good sense of balancing all its different story components. The problem is, once that first half ends, once that purpose goes away, the movie again struggles to find a new one, and it, re it leads to a really unbalanced story. Because the focus shifts all over the place as the movie tries to regain this new sense of purpose. It, fo it shifts from, oh, the military story, to Ford trying to get home to his family, to uh, Dr. Sarazawa, to Godzilla, to the Mutos, to all these different points, and it never really ma manages to balance them in a way where we can't have one without the other. Where the human story is happening because of the monsters. I mean, it is, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like the movie is just trying to retain, alright, we spent the first half focusing on the humans, so we've got to continue focusing on them. Yes, but not to the extent that the movie does. You have to do that in a good monster movie. Rodan doesn't stop being about the humans once Rodan shows up, neither does the original Gojira for that matter, which this movie is, for the most part, trying to retain the spirit of. But you have to balance it out, and the movie never really achieves that, which is ironic because the whole movie is about, well, achieving a natural balance, which is Godzilla. So it's funny that Godzilla is the thing that is never truly balanced with the rest of the movie. Very, very ironic. So again, good ideas here in the story, but not all of them are executed well. But some of them really, really are. Um, the government conspiracy is a great idea for a Godzilla movie, and again, it gives the first half that really good sense of intrigue and purpose. Again, once all of that is lost, the story really, really suffers because it becomes about waiting for the action at that point, which is a problem that a lot of movies have. It's, all right, building the story, we're waiting for the action, then the action happens. So now the movie just becomes about waiting for the next action scene. There's a, there's a good way to balance it where you give enough action, you give enough story, and you can't have one without the other. Monster movies have achieved this. Gamera 3 Revenge of Iris is one of the best examples of this, of perfectly blending the action with the story. Godzilla desperately tries to get there, but never truly does. Gareth Edwards' whole mantra with, with making this movie was trying to get there, making you wait for the action so that, when you, so that way when you finally got it, you would truly, truly appreciate it. But it never quite achieves that in the best of ways. What we're left with is story, the best parts of the story ending, and then the action kind of happening, but then having to cutting but having to cut back to less interesting story points because Gareth Edwards wants to hold back on the action until the very, very end. It's frustrating and very disappointing because of how good the first half is. Again, not to say that the second half is bad and that we're, the whole movie should just be a one long action scene after Godzilla is introduced. But no, you have to balance these things. The action needs to have a consequence and the story has to have a consequence on the action. And that is the biggest thing that the movie never gets right, is balancing those two aspects of it. It feels like the action and story are two separate things. The movie never truly masters that sense of impact one has on the other, which is frustrating. Now, the movie does try to achieve this sense of purpose that the first half had, with the first half building to the reveal of the monsters, so then the second half should be about building to the collision course of the three monsters. Now, from the from the get-go, the issue is that, is that each monster isn't equally well-developed. The male Muto is bar none the best developed, with that whole first half building to him. Godzilla? Eh, it's not so great. The build-up to seeing Godzilla is lengthy, and that wait is strong. You're definitely rewarded for waiting with that epic introduction in Hawaii. But the problem is that the story just seems to end, and then the movie then for 15 minutes seems to be focused on introducing Godzilla, which is a little a lengthy bit of film time, but it's not as much as the male Muto got, and this is supposed to be Godzilla's movie. Uh, you really should have balanced the two monsters with building both monsters at the same time because they're both going to appear at similar times. Here's how I would have fixed it if I was writing or editing this movie. I would have had Godzilla actually show up first. Because Godzilla fight movies in the past have been about introducing the new monster relative to Godzilla. 
or at least the best ones have. The most generic Godzilla fight movies have been seemingly movies that could have been about the monster that Godzilla's fighting and Godzilla just seems thrown in. Sadly, this comes closer to that than it does to the ideal monster fight movie like, say, like, say Godzilla vs. Biollante where you can't have one monster without the other. And the story has to complement both monsters. But Godzilla at least gets some sense of build-up with that scene in the conference room then building to the scene in Hawaii. There is a slow progression there. Again, it's not as good as the Muto, but it's good. Then we have the third end of this piece, which is the female Muto, who does not get that same degree of development. Godzilla and the male Muto have their first conflict in Hawaii, and then the movie then has to quickly introduce the female Muto so we can start building on that uh, collision course idea with building into the final fight. So, it seems almost like a rehash because then Sarazawa reveals this third spore, where it is, and that the male Muto is heading towards her. The idea of another Muto being around is introduced quickly, and then two seconds later, we just see it. And it just feels very, very reminiscent of the male Muto, and it feels like a little bit of rehash, where you've got a bunch of military guys going into the nuclear, uh, I'm gonna call them vaults, at Yucca Mountains, seeing the light just like Sarazawa did in the beginning of the movie, and then seeing a giant hole in the mountain where the female Muto came out. It attacks Las Vegas, and then they work out the whole rest of the story of the male Muto coming to mate with the female. Again, it's fine, but it's not balanced. Again, the male Muto got the best development, and then the other two monsters got lackluster development by comparison. The movie really needed... I think the movie needed another go-round at the script in order to hammer out the other two monsters getting equally good development to the male Muto. Now again, I think this could have been solved by introducing Godzilla first, starting off the movie about him and then building into the other monsters through him. Maybe what they could have done is have the male Muto talking to the female while they were still in their cocoons, waking up Godzilla, and Godzilla heading towards the Janjira power plant. Maybe Brian Cranston starts to see um, the connections of all this monster stuff with all these, maybe these bolts disappearing because Godzilla because Godzilla's waking up. So, start the movie off about Godzilla and then introduce the other monsters through him. I think that would have been a much better way to handle it because then it would have equal balance because you're introducing both the male Muto and Godzilla at the same time and then you could also introduce the idea of the female Muto through that as well. That hour-long build-up should have been focused on introducing all three monsters and it's not. So, I'm going to get off that point now, and also just say that I also think that the story should have been a little bit more about, in order to make the thing feel a little bit more like it had a sense of purpose, is make it more about people's reactions to the giant monsters. Which is what I think a lot of people wanted the movie to be about, be about to begin with. The world reacting to Godzilla's return, or in this case his introduction to the general public. The movie would have also been given a sense of uniqueness in that way, by having it be about people reacting to these giant atomic creatures from the dawn of time that they didn't know about because of a government cover-up. As it stands, the movie goes for a little bit more of a semi-routine disaster movie tone by just having a bunch of destruction and people trying to survive the disaster. I would have liked to see some more news reports about, oh my god, there are these giant monsters and here's what we know. There's a little bit of that in the special features on the Blu-ray with the uh, very uh, awesome uh, special feature called the Godzilla Revelation, which is done as kind of like a, a YouTube video-esque um, guy in his computer talking about this conspiracy theory about Godzilla. And I, I wish a little bit more of that was in the movie because it would have gone a long way to making the thing more interesting and a little bit less routine. And it also would have given it a better sense of purpose to make it about people reacting and then dealing with the aftermath of people reacting. It also would have solved some problems that I'm going to bring up in a little bit. But speaking of people's reactions and why it's a little bit of a problem that they don't have those reactions in the movie, let's get into the human cast. And 